for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom. Right, Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the Saturday evening service of May the 25th, 1996, for the Memorial Day Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campground, Hunt Springs National Park, Arkansas. Norman Parrish is the speaker for the evening. Now let's uh, begin to study the Word of God tonight. How many came with a, a deep desire to get into the Word and learn something that will be of value, will be of use? We're going to talk about spiritual blindness tonight. Spiritual blindness. If I'm not uh, mistaken... Several years ago, I spoke on this subject, and but most of you weren't here, and if uh, a few of you were here at that time, well, probably you've forgotten the message, so this will be a refresher. Uh, we need to, to go back over some of these subjects and uh, bring them back to memory so that we can profit from them. Let's open in 2 Kings chapter 6. How many read the story of uh, Elisha and the armies of Syria? You remember the king of Syria had a, had, a, had a military plan to take over Israel. He attacked Israel, invaded Israel. And yet all his strategic movements were <laughs> discovered ahead of time so that the king of Israel, though he was outnumbered and outarmed, was able to, uh, you know, uh, how would we say, resist this uh, attack of the... Syrian army, and the king of Syria just got disturbed. He said, we must have some spies in the camp. There's somebody that is cheating on us. Somebody's going over there and informing of the Israelites of our uh, strategic moves. And so one of his soldiers or one of his uh, ministers of state said, no, it just so happens that in Israel there's a prophet that knows everything. I mean, he knows every move you take. I mean, what you talk here in secret in this chamber he can hear it and he can report it to the king of Israel. And so the king of Syria forgot about perhaps capturing the king of Israel. He decided to capture the prophet of Israel. Uh, prophets were a greater threat in those days than even kings. So he sent a mighty army to Dothan, the small town where Elisha lived. They had horses. They had chariots. I mean, they were armed to the teeth. And the Bible says that they came and surrounded the city and blockaded it, uh, besieged it. I mean, no one could enter, no one could leave. The next morning when, uh, I suppose it was Gehazi, woke up and he went outside the house to take care of some of his physiological needs, he lifted up his eyes and he saw this mighty army surrounding that village. And he got panic-stricken. He ran into the house terrorized. He said, my Lord, what are we going to do? There's no way to escape. They've come to capture you or they've come to kill you. And... Elisha, in a very nonchalant way, said, well, there's nothing to worry about. Why get all stirred up? Because there are more with us than with them. It's right here in chapter 6, verse 16. He answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, what happened? Immediately, Elijah said, Lord, open this man's eyes that he might see. And when he got open the, this, this uh, man's eyes, Gehazi's eyes, he saw the surrounding mountains covered with an angelic host. So it says the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. God had sent his heavenly host, uh, mighty warriors, with horses and chariots. and uh, they, were, they outnumbered the Syrians, maybe three to one or four to one. Elisha said, you know, there's, we have nothing to be afraid of. God's going to intervene and God's going to undo the wicked plans of the king of Syria. Now, what, the thing I want to point out tonight, brethren, is that Gehazi was blind, spiritually blind. I believe Gehazi was, was one of the sons of the prophets. I believe he was being trained and groomed to be Elisha's successor. You remember Eli, Eli, Elijah trained Elisha, and Elisha was training Gehazi to take his place eventually as the prophet of Israel. 
But Gehazi had some very, very um, great flaws. In chapter 5, remember the story of Naaman? That Elisha refused payment. He would not take any of the gifts, the valuable gifts that Naaman wanted given to honor him for his healing. But Gehazi sneaked out of the house, followed him, and concocted a story that there were some, some of the sons of the prophet that had suddenly appeared on the scene and that they needed money and they needed clothing. And he, uh, in, very, uh, in a very deceptive way, he was able to get a hold of two talents of silver and two changes of clothing. He took them home and hid them. But you remember what Elisha said? Where have you been? Oh, I didn't go anywhere. He just flat outright lied. I didn't go anywhere and I didn't leave the house. And he said, my heart, my spirit, what? Went with you. That was an out-of-the-body experience. See, that experience that the spiritualists call astral projection, cosmic flight, is a counterfeit experience. Because there's a true experience that many of the prophets of old had where they were released in the spirit. They were transported in the spirit. Do you know that John the Revelator was transported through the centuries? It says in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, I being in the spirit on the day of the Lord. You know how most writers on the book of Revelation interpret that? That John was in a kind of like in ecstasies on the Isle of Patmos on a Sunday morning. Now, nowhere in the Bible is Sunday called the day of the Lord. Do you know what the day of the Lord is? The great and terrible day of the Lord? It's the day of God's judgment. It's the day of God's wrath. And that is still something that will be taking place in the very near future when God will pour out his wrath and indignation upon Satan and his followers, both demonic and human. Amen? So what does it mean when it says, I being in the Spirit on the day of the Lord? It means that John had a release in the Spirit. He went to an, into a trance-like state, into a rapture of understanding, into an ecstasy. And his Spirit was transported through time and he actually saw the end time events. He was there when they took place. See, in the spirit world where God dwells, there is no time, past, present, or future. It's the eternal present. Let me say this. Everything that ever was going to take place has already taken place in the spirit world. It only needs to be implemented in this physical world. Amen? And so John was released, transported in the spirit, and he actually saw the events as they were transpiring and with his faulty vocabulary, he tried to describe them. And many things he described are in types and symbols. That's where we have trouble interpreting the book of Revelation. Many prophets of old had this type of experiences. Ezekiel had them. And even Paul had them. See, that's one of the abilities, supernatural abilities, that God has given his servants, the prophets. So Elisha followed Gehazi, and actually Elisha in the spirit saw what Gehazi was doing, the transaction that he was, was doing and making with Naaman. And that's why he soundly rebuked him. And listen to this. He pronounced judgment. You know, because of this sin, a curse fell upon Naaman and on his descendants. See, the Bible says here in 527, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. See, this was a curse not to the second and third or fourth generation. It was going to continue in the family line for generations untold. It's a curse that unless it was discovered and unless it was canceled, probably destroyed uh, Gehazi's family down through the centuries. Well, let's go back to the story. Gehazi was blind. He couldn't see in the spirit, although he was being probably trained and groomed to be a prophet. Now, why did... Gehazi lose the ability to see, if he ever had it. Why? Because of sin. Amen? Because of his lying. Because of his deception. Huh? Because of his greed. Yeah. And another sin that we find here in chapter 6 and in verse uh, 16, fear. That's why Elisha said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Do you know fear plays tricks on us? destroys our ability to feel God and see God in action in our lives. Any sin renders us insensitive to the Holy Spirit. We lose our spiritual sensitivity when we uh, practice sin. Amen? When we refuse to repent, when we refuse to confess, and when we try to hide, to mask 
our sin, we're going to lose our spiritual sensitivity. That's why many times people go to church and they leave and if someone would ask them, you know, how was the service? Oh, it was boring. Well, the service wasn't boring. They were the ones that were boring. I mean, the, the Spirit moved. Many people got blessed. Many people got healed. But they didn't feel anything. Why? Because sin dulls your spiritual senses. How many know that we have five spiritual senses just as much as we have five physical senses? Huh? There is the counterpart in the spirit world to what we have in the physical world. You have physical eyesight. There's, there's the, uh, the uh, spiritual eyesight. You have spir- uh, physical he- hearing. There's spiritual hearing. How many of you ever sm- smelt the presence of God? I only smelt it once. I remember in 1963 or 1964 when we were just uh, beginning to experience a mighty move of the Spirit of God in Guatemala that lasted 10, 12 years. One night, as I stepped out of the church uh, into a patio, I smelt the most wonderful odor I'd ever felt, smelt up to that date. And I've never smelt since then. A perfume that no, none of these great companies that make cosmetics has ever, ever been able to match. And it was the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And it was wonderful. It, it, it was just, well, it only lasted maybe 20, 30 seconds. But that was enough to leave an indelible impression upon my heart and my mind. See, God has created spiritual senses. But most of us have never developed them. That's the difference between a person that has the gift of prophecy and a person that has the office of a prophet. A prophet is a man of spirit. A prophet is a spiritual man. A man, prophet is a man that has these spiritual senses fully developed. Did you hear that? You as a spirit-filled believer can have certain spiritual gifts. But only those that have the office of a prophet probably will develop these spiritual senses to the nth degree. Amen? Now, this the, we have here a, a case um, uh, of a man that probably at one time had spiritual eyesight, but because of his sin, sinful ways, he lost that ability. And it only was, was because of Elisha's intercession that God opened this young man's eyes temporarily so that he was able to see in the spirit world and see God's army mobilizing uh, uh, to protect uh, God's servant, the prophet Elijah. Now let's turn to Numbers 22. And we're going to find another case of, of a man that lost his ability to see in the spirit world. And this man's name is Balaam. How many have read about the, story, the story of this man called Balaam? Do you know that at one time Balaam was a true prophet of God? This is a story of a man, a prophet that went wrong, that went bad. This is a story of a prophet, a true prophet that became eventually a false prophet. Because in Numbers 13, 22, it says that when this man died and died tragically, he didn't die as a prophet, he died as a sooth. Savior. He died as a fortune teller. He died as a divinator. This man lost out with God. He actually backslid. And he be, after being an instrument in God's hand, he became an instrument in Satan's hand to deceive God's people and lead God's people astray. Do you hear that? Now, uh, uh, this man Balaam is called in chapter... How many have opened their numbers? In chapter 23, verse... I mean, chapter 24, verse 3... In the final part of the verse, it says, the man whose eyes are open. And then in chapter 24, verse 16, uh, I'm going to read the whole verse. It says, he hath said, which heard the words of God, that was spiritual hearing, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, that spiritual eyesight, falling into a trance, but having his eyes, what? Open. He was in a trance-like state, and yet his eyes were open to the spirit world. He saw what was happening in the spirit world. And at that time, he received one of the first Messianic revelations. He was one of the first prophets in the Old Testament time that prophesied the coming of Jesus Christ uh, to the world. See, this man was mighty. I think Balaam could have gone down in history as the greatest prophet of all time. Greater than Moses, greater than Isaiah, greater than David, greater than Elijah. But uh, sad to say, he strayed from the truth. Now, what was the cause of Balaam's downfall? Well, two. Two. I, uh, or maybe more than two, but I'm just going to mention two. One was greed. Uh, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was a money grubber, like some of many of our modern evangelists. He got greedy. 
the king of uh, Moab uh, wanted to hire him so that he would put a curse on Israel. He knew, the king knew that this man's word was with power, that he had the power of life and death in his hands. And he said, I'll pay you a fortune if you will just come and put a curse on Israel. The king knew that he couldn't defeat Israel. Huh? And so he said, maybe with the help of this prophet, I can cause Israel to go down in defeat. And you know, when uh, Balaam was very spiritual, at least he was very pious, and he said to the emissaries of the king of Moab, you know, spend the night, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to seek God, and whatever God tells me to do, I'll do it. And that night God appeared unto him, and God said, don't go, period. And Balaam got up the next morning, he was sad, he was forlorn. He said, you know, God's a party pooper. I'd just love to go, but God forbid me. Well, the, these ambassadors went back to the king and said, you know, we just noticed this man, uh, he's tempted. Uh, just up the ante, you know, just increase, offer him more money, offer him greater honor, and, and we're sure he'll come. So they went back the second time, and they uh, invited him to come and place himself uh, at the service of the king of Moab. And you know, Balaam said, well, I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to go and seek God's face, and whatever God tells me, I'll do. What should he have said right off the bat? You know, he, say, he should have said, no, God said no once, and he's going to say no twice. I mean, God doesn't change. You know, there's a passage here in Numbers 22, 23, 24, where uh, Balaam talks about God's immutability. God doesn't change. I mean, he, whatever he says, he upholds. He's not wishy-washy. He doesn't waver. He doesn't change his mind like man does. But Balaam tempted God. He went back and started interceding and started praying. And God appeared to him and said, Well, if you want to go, just go then. We call that the permissive will of God. Really, I don't believe there's a permissive will of God. I believe there's only a directive will of God. What we call permissive will of God is God letting us do our own thing. He just gives up on us because we're so stubborn and we're so adamant. And he says, okay, just go ahead and do whatever you want. And, but you're going to suffer the consequence. And so Balaam got up early and he packed his, his clothes, his best clothes, so that he could appear in the royal court of the king of Moab. I mean, he got his pickup truck ready. No, no, it wasn't a pickup truck. It was a little ass. It was a little donkey. And he started towards Moab. And the Bible says, let's, let's turn there. That's the important part. Here in uh, chapter 22, verse 22, it says, And God's anger was kindled because he went. If God had told him to go, God had given permission, and God had given license to go, why did God get angry? Because this man was acting out of rebellion. Did you hear that? When you act upon God's permissive will, you're actually acting in rebellion to God. Did you hear that? That's why we get in a lot of trouble sometimes in business and marriage and everything else, because we insist on doing our own thing. Our own thing, on, and the day comes when God says, okay, that's what you want to do. Go ahead and do it. I'm not going to oppose, but <laughs> you're going to pay through the nose. And we do. And so the Bible says here, and God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Adversary. You know that perhaps the only time in life that God becomes our adversary is when we fall into rebellion. I'll show you right here in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. In verse 10 it says, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Why did God turn against them? Why did God become their enemy? Why did God fight against them? Why? Because they had fallen into rebellion. And rebellion anger vexes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit turns against them and becomes our enemy. And a lot of us, brethren, have acted in rebellion in many things related to marriage, to home, to business, to ministry. And we're paying a frightful price today. Amen? Why are you so quiet? What was Balaam's second sin? The first was covetousness or greed. What was the second one? Rebellion. Willfulness. And let's go back now to Numbers. Numbers 22. And what happened? The donkey saw the angel, but the prophet didn't see the angel. I wonder who was more of a donkey, the, the two-legged one or the four-legged one? The one that was b below or the one that was on top? Well, the, the ass saw the angel several times. And you remember, he tried to avoid an encounter. He went off into a, a little uh, 
You know, he walked off into the open field and Balaam beat him back and beat him up and forced him back to the road. And then he tried to take a few steps and leaned against the wall and nearly crushed the prophet's leg. And the third time, what did he do? He just flopped down in the middle of the road and wouldn't budge. And now let's read what happened then. Verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the, uh, the angel Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn, drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his feet, or fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, oppose thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from the, me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me, now, therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. I'll just turn around and go home. He shouldn't even wait it. As soon as he saw that angel standing there in the middle of the road, maybe measuring eight, nine, ten feet, with his eyes just like a flame of fire, with his sword withdrawn, he should have turned around and dug his spurs in the height of that ass and headed home 60, 80, 90, uh, miles an hour. But he said, you know, if it displeased thee... I will go home. And the Lord said, just go on. If that's what you want to do, just go on. And that's when Balaam's downfall began. He fell into apostasy. He was disgraced. And he died a terrible death, a tragic death, because he disobeyed the Lord. Now notice, Balaam, who was a seer, because the prophets of old were called what? Seers. He was a seer, yet he lost the ability to see. He couldn't see that angel. And it was because of what? sin. Now, it wasn't the same sin that Gehazi had indulged in. Gehazi had lied, had deceived. Oh, yeah, he was motivated, too, by greed. But in, in this case, there was, you know, a different, different overtone. Balaam was a mature prophet, and he, uh, because probably of the measure of success that he achieved, he thought he could step out on his own, that he could act outside the guidance and the direction of of God when he got into trouble. Now let's turn to another case in Genesis chapter 21. How many read the story of Hagar? You remember when uh, Ismael was about 12, 13 years of age, Isaac was born. And Ismael would, you know, kind of mock this baby. I mean, Sarah got so upset when she saw Ismael make, poking fun at the baby. And she talked to Abraham and told Abraham that it was time for him to kick Hagar out of the house. Now, Abraham didn't want to do that because he loved his son. But the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, You go and you obey. You obey your wife. I think this is the only time in the Bible that a man was told to obey his wife. And don't take this exception as a rule, please. Some of the men are getting nervous right now. God said there in chapter 21, verse 12, It said, In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. The only case I can find in the Bible that God told a man to obey his wife. But don't turn an exception into a rule. Okay? Let not this be an excuse to your rebellion as a wife. Okay? So Abraham reluctantly sent Hagar away. And you know, I just always wonder why Abraham was so miserly. What did he give Hagar? He should have given her a, a large amount of money to take care of, of the boy for maybe a few months or a few years until the boy was grown up enough to be able to work. No, he didn't even give him camels. Do you know what he gave him? A loaf of bread and a flask of water. That's all. And remember that Abraham was immensely rich. He was the richest man on earth at that time, probably. And yet he just gave the Hagar a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. I've always <laughs> wondered why. But I preach to my pastors in Latin America about depending on God, you know. When man's resources run out, then God steps in. And he gives us his inexhaustible resources. Because when, after a few days, two, three days, they ran out of bread, they ran out of water, they came to a place in the wilderness, and Hagar lay Ismael under a bush. He's called a child, but he wasn't a child. He was a teenager. And she walked off maybe a half a block away. Now, she didn't want it. She said, I don't want to be present when my son dies of starvation or dehydration. And she began to weep thoroughly. And I want you to read what it says in verse uh, 17. And God heard the voice of whom? Not of the mother, but of the lad. Her prayers were ineffective. Why? Because she 
she given over to sorrow, to grief, to despair, to hopelessness. Yeah, that can hinder an attitude like that can hinder our prayers. Our prayers not even, might even get through the ceiling. Uh, God heard the prayers of Ishmael, didn't hear the prayers of Hagar. And then in verse 19 it says, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. The well of water was there all the time. I don't think God created that well at that moment. I think it was there but because of her what? Her grief and sorrow, she didn't see that well. Do you know that grief and sorrow can be a sin? Yes. I found five, six verses in Scripture that say that grief and sorrow are, is a sin that can lead to blindness. Not only spiritual blindness, but even physical blindness. If you've lost your family, if you've lost your job, and you give in to sorrow, and you, and you, are, you just will not be comforted. You know, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit is here in the world, is to comfort us, isn't He? And we don't let the Holy Spirit carry out His duties. We refuse to be comforted. And we go on morning, month after month, year after year. And because of that, we begin to suffer the consequences, not only spiritually, but even physically. She lost her ability to see. She was blind. And God had to open her eyes so that she could see that well. You know what kind of well that was? An artesian well. It just sprang up. And they built a city. I mean, first a house and then a city around that well. That's where Ishmael and his mother settled. And he became a great nation. I mean, it was an exhaustible supply. And I'll tell you, brethren, as a word of advice to those that are in ministry, when man's resources are depleted, then God steps in and provides us with his inexhaustible resources. I've learned through the years not to depend on man. Uh, We don't have any pledge support. We don't have any great denomination standing behind us. We don't have churches that have pledged $300,000, $500,000, $800,000 Three hundred, five hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars a month. No, I, we depend month after month on God, and every time we receive the report of what has come in, I just marvel. I just stand there in wonderment because God, through different means, has provided for all our needs. You know, we never run in the red once. Never. You know, some of you have been on our mailing list for many, several years, and you've never received from us a letter saying we're going under. Please, and you know, if you don't. If you don't help us this month, we're going to go into bankruptcy. Never! And you never will! Uh, God has supported us on the mission field, my wife and I, for over 40 years now. And He's not going to give up on us this late in the, in the game. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, I invite people to stand behind us in financial support. But I'll tell you something, brethren. If you don't feel led to do it, it's all right. We're not going to become enemies. Because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And you're going to be the loser. Did you hear that? Because the blessing that you could have received by supporting our ministry, somebody else is going to receive. Well, you didn't say amen to that. Uh But see, when God steps in in the the picture, uh, He'll provide abundantly for every need that we might have in order to carry out the calling and the vision that He has placed upon us. Okay, here we have three cases of three people that were blind. And God had to open their spiritual eyes so that they could see. Each case is different. But in every case, what we discover, brethren, is that they were blind because of some kind of sin in their lives. And I'll tell you, brethren, spiritual blindness is caused directly by sin. Sin will always result in spiritual blindness. As I travel over America from coast to coast, border to border, and I minister in so many different churches. I minister in mainline churches. Last year in the fall, I preached in Presbyterian churches. Southern Baptist churches, United Methodist churches, United Churches in Christ, mainline denominations that weren't even spirit-filled. I preached in Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, independent churches. I preached in churches that believe the sonship message, others don't. Deliverance message, others don't. I preached in Word of Faith churches. I preached in Kingdom Now churches. I preached in... I don't think there's anybody in America, and I'm not bragging, that, that has... So many open doors in so many different churches and denominations. And I ask God to give me wisdom wherever I go to preach the message at their level of spiritual growth. A message that will challenge them and incite them to, to seek God for greater things that are, uh, are out there according to the plan and purpose of God for His church. Amen? Now, one of the things I've discovered as I travel throughout the United States and Canada and all over the American continent is that most Christians today 
even pastors, even leaders, are blind, are spiritual blind. They cannot even see their own needs. They can't even see their own condition, much less the condition of the world. They can't see what's happening in America. They can't see what's happening around the world. You know, they can't see beyond the tip of their nose. You know that in Second Peter chapter 1, it talks about being nearsighted. And many of us, brethren, are either partially blind, or we have tunnel vision, or we are nearsighted, but something's wrong with our spiritual eyesight. And we cannot see. You remember, Martha was so grief-stricken that she even tried to oppose what Jesus Christ wanted to do in order to bring Lazarus back to life. Jesus said, you know, take away the stone. And she said, oh, no, 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 Lord. It's four days and the man stinks to high heaven. And that's going to, it's going to be terrible. And Jesus said, listen, Martha, I have told you many times. I'm just transliterating. I have told you many times, if you will only believe, you will what? We'll see. Now there we see one of the first causes of spiritual blindness. You know what that is? Unbelief. Doubt. Mistrust. When we don't believe God, when we don't believe God's Word as it is being preserved by the Holy Ghost, we are going to become spiritually blind. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. What does it say there? In whom the God of this world has what? Or the God of this age has blinded the eyes of whom? Of them that believe not. The God of this age, Satan, acquires legal rights to strip us of our ability to see. To see God, to see God's glory, to see God's power in action. Because of our unbelief, that's cause number one of spiritual blindness. And I tell you, brethren, if we uh, persist in refusing to believe God's Word and God's ability to work in our midst, we are going to be blind. And things are going to happen all around us and we are not going to be able to see them, much less participate in them. We won't enjoy them. We won't benefit from them. Because spiritual blindness has come upon us because of our what? Unbelief. Many of us have too many doubts and too many questions about the Word of God. We don't take God's Word at face value. I'm a literalist. I believe what God says He means and, and what He means He says. Now, I, 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 I believe that the Word of God gives room to spiritualization. I believe in types and shadows and symbols. But I believe that many of the end time people have fallen into a terrible error of spiritualizing Scripture in general. And I think we need to take God's Word literally first and then seek for the deeper meanings of the Word of God. Uh, many passages have two, three different interpretations, spiritually and prophetically and etc., etc., but we must take God's Word at face value and not try to twist the Word and change the Word to mean something entirely different than what God intended the Word to say. Amen? You know, the Pharisees and knowed the power of God's Word through their traditions. And we many times know the power of God's Word through our diverse interpretations. We have to be very careful, brethren, that we don't destroy the effectiveness of the Word of God by spiritualizing everything. The first, when I read the Scripture, I try to take the Word of, literally. I know that there are some prophetic passages that will not permit us a literal interpretation then we must wait on God to give us the true spiritual interpretation. But we're wrong if we, in, if we try to spiritualize everything because we destroy the value of the Word of God, the effectiveness of the Word of God in our own lives. Amen? See, who is the one that blinds us so that we cannot see, you know, God, His glory, His power, His ability in, everything in our lives in any given situation? Satan. You know, spiritual blindness is caused by His Spirit, Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verses uh, 8 and 10. From them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Here's a spirit called the spirit of slumber that God gives. God sends. Do you know that God... <laughs> I, I, I tell you something, brother. God, Satan is not doing anything behind God's back. I call Satan God's whipping boy. Huh? Satan is carrying out God's orders. Huh? Satan is not doing anything in contradiction to God's plans and purposes in the world. And without him knowing that he is contributing many times to the fulfillment of those plans and purposes. And there's numerous passages in the Bible, even the Old and New Testament, that say that God sent a spirit. God sent a spirit. Uh, I don't know, one of the preachers this week used Judges 9.23, where it says that in fulfillment of Jotham's curse, the curse that this young boy 
called Joseph and placed on Abimelech, God sent a spirit, a spirit of division, a spirit of betrayal between Abimelech and the man, men of Sikkim. I think it was mm, Dr. Null this afternoon. Yes. God sent that spirit. See? And here it says that God sent a spirit of slumber, of deep sleep, and they lost their ability to see. They had eyes to see, but they couldn't see. And they had a head ears to hear, but they couldn't hear. Now, verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow their back away always. See, what the Bible shows us here, brethren, is that because of the sin of unbelief, Israel lost the ability to see into the spirit world. Israel was blinded. A spirit of blindness, a spirit of slumber came over Israel. And although they had eyes to see, they couldn't see in at all. Amen? So who caused the spiritual blindness? Satan. But on the legal basis of what? Of sin. Our sin. Our sin grants Satan certain right to destroy our spiritual senses so that we cannot see, we cannot hear. We're totally insensitive, not only to God, but many times to Satan's attacks. Many times we are surrounded, we are besieged by demons and we don't feel them. We're like in a drug condition. That's all drugs do to us. Huh? Drugs don't heal. They just relieve the symptoms. Amen? You have a headache and you drug yourself in order to get rid of that headache, a migraine or whatever it might be. It's not getting rid of the problem. The problem is still there. In fact, it's festering. And probably it's, it's getting worse. It's getting much more complicated. That drug just destroys the pain. That's all it does. And you might have a brain tumor that's causing that pain. And by taking that medication, what are you doing? Are you doing yourself good or are you doing yourself <laughs> something very, very wrong? Because that tumor will keep on growing and growing and growing until no painkiller will get rid of the pain. And then you'll have to go to the doctor and have all these scans and all these x-rays. And they'll find that brain tumor and said it's inoperable. If you would have come back three months ago, six months ago, maybe you would have done something for you. Well, that's, brethren, what happens to many Christians. Uh, we're drugged by the world. We're drugged by the worldly pleasures, by the worldly enticements. And uh, we just can't see. We can't see. We've lost our ability to see into the spirit world. We can't see what's happening to us, to our families, to our churches, to our communities. We can't see what's happening in the world today. You know, the disciples were spiritually blind. Remember when Jesus had the interview with the woman at the well? They went into town. They went looking for food. They wanted to get some hamburgers or some hot dogs in Samaria. And Jesus, well, spent his time talking to this woman. And he led her to God. She had an experience, a life transforming experience. And when the disciples came back, they stood at a distance and they were, were amazed that Jesus, being a Jew, would even dare speak to this woman who was a Samaritan. Well, when she left, she and went back to her village to go and talk to the men that she had fornicated with. They came, to, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, eat. And he said, no, I'm not hungry. I, I have a meat that you may know nothing of. My meat is to what? To do the will of my father and to finish the work of my father. And then he went on to say, Say ye not, there are four months and then come of the harvest. That's what they were thinking in their mind. Why well, get, I get all stirred up. Why well, get in a huff? Why well, get in a hurry? We've got plenty of time. We've got four months. They were procrastinators by nature like you and I are. Let's leave this task for later. Let's enjoy life. Let's take it easy. And many Christians have that same idea, you know. I'm young. I'm going to travel. I'm going to work. I'm going to have fun. And when I get around there, 55, 60, when... You know, when I'm getting up in eight years, then uh, I'm going to do something for God. How mistaken can they be? Yeah? Now, what did Jesus say to the disciples? Now, you men lift up your eyes and what? Look! They were blind to the needs. See, they were in Samaria. In the whole province of Samaria, probably up to that moment, there had never been one single convert. Jesus had been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he didn't have time uh, for the Samaritans and for the Gentiles at that stage of his ministry. Now, later on, he said, uh, going to all the world, beginning at Jerusalem. Huh? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even unto the ends of the earth. He included Samaria in his plans. And Philip went down to Samaria and turned the whole city of Samaria to God. Remember that case in Acts chapter 8? But when these men went into town, Peter and John and Andrew and Philip, they went into town to buy those hot dogs or those, uh, that pizza. What happened? Hundreds of people there that were in need of God, but did they stop to evangelize one of them? They were so prejudiced. 
their full who were so full of bigotry, they were so full of hatred towards the Samaritans that they just <laughs> got their food and ran out of town. They wanted to get as far away from Samaria as possible. And Jesus said, the harvest is already what? White. It's ripe. It's there for the picking. And brethren, many of us are not involved in missionary work. We don't care about missions. I've heard many red-blooded American people tell me, why worry about the heathen in Africa and Asia ah, when we've got them right here around us? But you know they're not even doing anything to reach the heathen in their own vicinity, in their own neighborhood. And they don't pray for missions. They don't give the mission. They are completely selfish like the disciples were. And you know why? They're blind. They cannot see. These are the days of opportunity, Bible brethren. The Bible says the night comes when no man shall work. And yet we go on living our happy, lucky, lucky life, huh? and we forget that we have been placed in this world, in this generation, to establish God's kingdom, to advance God's kingdom. Amen? Boy, it's quiet tonight. I think we were, this house is full of Baptists and Methodists. I think all the mainland denominations sent their representatives to this camp meeting. Amen? Okay, let's look at several other causes of spiritual blindness. And we're just have to going to run through these quickly. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. And this is a very common cause in the body of Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 11. But he that hateth his brother, isn't that a strong word? He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Hatred. Well, you, you, you might say, I don't hate anybody. But let me tell you something. There are some people that you don't love, and if you don't love them, actually you are what? Hating them. There is no middle of the road. You know, the lack of love for our brethren can be evidenced, for example, in the spirit of unforgiveness. Is there somebody that you haven't been able to forgive? Is there somebody that you still hold grudges against? I've, I've met with people, counsel with people, that are holding grievances that are 20, 30, 40 years old. I, they, they have a, a spirit of unforgiveness to people that are long, long departed. They've been dead and buried for years, and yet <laughs> these people are still resenting them and hating them. One brother today told me that he was delivered from the spirit of bitterness. Praise God. We can be bitter against our employers. We can be bitter, bitter against our neighbors. We can be bitter against our former lovers and spouses. We can be bitter against pastors and churches that defrauded us. Listen, brethren, the Bible says that if we don't love, we are going to end up how? Blind. Blind. The lack of love leads to spiritual blindness. Are you in that condition? You know, we just we are like dogs sometimes. Excuse me for making a, a comparison. But we love to lick our own wounds, don't we? We just love to lick our own wounds. We get pleasure out of licking the wounds of the past. And we lie around just remembering all these traumas and all these abuses and all these things that we suffered as children or as, as youth. We don't release them. And brethren, this has caused spiritual blindness. You need be, to be delivered of that spirit of unforgiveness, that spirit of resentment, that spirit of bitterness, that spirit of animosity, that spirit of hatred, that spirit of strife, in order for God to be able to open your eyes so that you can see the glory of God manifested in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? Boy, boy. Let's go on to the third cause of, spir of spiritual blindness. Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel chapter 12. God brought you to this camp. I'm sure he brought you to be delivered. And one of the things you need to be delivered is the spirit of what? Blindness. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are what? A rebellious house. What was the cause of bl blindness here? Why have you become insensitized? Why have you lost your ability to see or to hear, spiritually speaking? Why? Rebellion. We talked about this uh, yesterday uh, when we talked about the will, the stubbornness, the obstinacy, the rebellion. That's one of the results. Blindness is one of the results of rebellion. We become hardened. The devil pulls the wool over our eyes. He puts blinders on us. We end up with scales over our eyes so we're not able to see what God wants us to see in this generation. Okay, let's look at another one. Isaiah 44. I have about... Eight or ten here, and I'm not going to give uh, mention all of them because I want to bring this to an end quickly. Isaiah 44, chapter, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what it says here. 
talking about idolatry. In the residue thereof maketh a god, even as graven in it, she falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes, for he, God, has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their heart that they cannot understand. Talking about idolatry. But you know, brethren, there's a lot of Christians today that have idols, the idols of the heart. Oh, they don't have a graven image. They don't have uh, in their homes images made out of wood and, and metal. No. But you know, anything that stands between us and the Lord is an idol. Amen? Your children and grandchildren can be your idols. Your job. Your favorite sport. Your friends. Huh? Your, your properties. You know, one of the most common idols in, in American Christians today can be found in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm just going to read quickly the verse. Verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? What is it talking about here? What is covetousness? The love of what? Money. Huh? Money is a god. And it's, in the Bible, he is called Naaman. And you cannot worship Naaman or serve Naaman and serve God at the same time. You know why some of you have never tithed? And I can say by the Spirit tonight that there are several people that here that have refused to tithe. And they found arguments to justify their disobedience to God. Did you know that tithing is not an Old Testament practice? Abraham even began to tithe before the law was given. And he is the father of, 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 of believers. And if Abraham, our father of the faith, tithed, why can't we tithe? Do you know that Jesus approved of tithing? He certainly did. You remember I said yesterday that some of us are not even good Pharisees because the Pharisees used to fast twice a week, two whole days a week, and we don't even fast one. But well, here's another evidence that some of us don't even measure up. <laughs> we wouldn't even be accepted by the sect of the Pharisees. We wouldn't even be members in good standing with them because the Pharisees tithe everything that went through their hands. They would even tithe, you know what, those little herbs that they grew in their backyard to give flavor to their food. And some of us are so stingy that we refuse to tithe. And that's why the work of God many times is hindered because of lack of finance. There's a lot of good ministries out there, evangelists and prophets and teachers and even missionaries that are suffering for the lack of proper finance. You know, oh yes, we get hooked in by a lot of these big name evangelists, you know, the television programs, all the glamour and all the showmanship. And, you know, I was looking at one of these... Uh, well, I'm going to mention TBN. They had their tele, what do they call it, telemarathon or something? Telethon. And they brought in millions from all over the states. Millions upon millions upon millions. And other valid ministries don't have. They don't have the ability uh, to twist people's arms into giving. Huh? But listen, if we were obedient to the Holy Spirit, there'd be more than enough finance to support the ministries that are preaching the truth today. We saw that last night in a very spontaneous way. I don't know how much it, Brother Glenn said 7,000, but he said more than enough can in. Maybe 8,000, 9,000, who knows? And it just like that, it happened like that. That's how it should be always. There'd be more than enough to support some of the ministries that are here that are men of God that are not able to travel and not able to minister as widely as they should because... They are not properly supported by God's people. God's end time people. Amen? So covetousness can blind our eyes. Did you know that? Because we read in, in Isaiah 44 about idolatry, and the Bible says that covetousness or greed is idolatry. And if you love money more than you love God, then you are blind. You're spiritually blind, and uh, someday you're going to have to give an account to God for that. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 3. How many read the story, the letter that Jesus wrote to the church at Laodicea? Oh, were they uppity, weren't they? They were huffy. They thought they, they were very high-minded. Do you remember what they said? Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods, and I have need of nothing. And we could say, and nobody. They were self-sufficient. 
They were so full of pride and arrogance that they said, we don't need anything or anybody. We can take care of ourselves. And look at the indictment. And thou and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable. <laughs> Who's speaking? Jesus. He tore into the Pharisees. And he tore into these counterfeit Christians too. Thou art wretched, thou art miserable, thou art what? Poor, and thou art blind. Why were they blind? Oh, there were several causes. One was that self-sufficiency, the pride, the arrogance, the lukewarmness. You know, they were, they were not fully committed to God or to the church. They lived a, kind of like a half-baked Christianity. That's why Jesus said to them in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy, uh, what? I have and anoint thine eyes that thou mayest see. Who is the only one that can remove the blinders off our eyes? The Holy Spirit. Amen? Somebody in, the, in these last couple of days uh, read from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where it talks about the veil that was upon the eyes of the people of Israel. But it said when they turn, when they convert, uh, the Lord will remove that veil. For where the Spirit of the living God is, there is liberty. Who is the only one that can take the scales off our eyes? The Holy Spirit. And brethren, that's one part of our entire being that needs a divine visitation more than anyone else. We need that God, so God to come and anoint us with His eye salve, with his, the oil of His holy anointing, so that he, we can see. Uh, we can have 20-20 vision. And we can see exactly what God wants us to see so that we can work with Him in accomplishing His will in the world today. There are many, many verses that talk about the Holy Spirit opening our eyes. And brethren, our prayer should be the same prayer that David, the prophet, prayed in Psalm 119. He said, open my, not my eyes, in verse 18, that I might see the wonders, the marvels, that we might see your miracle working power. Uh, we can see your word in action, bringing life and strength and power uh, to the church and even to the rest of humanity. How many would be willing to confess tonight that you are at least partially blind? Come on, raise your hand. And if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to go down and raise it for you. Because apart from being blind, you're lazy too. And I tell you, brethren, I, I was kind saying partially. Some of us are as blind as bats. We're not nearsighted. We're blind. You remember that man that was healed by Jesus? That he could see, but he could see dimly. He saw men as trees. He could only see silhouettes, shadows. That's how many of us are today. Even in time people. People that are supposed to be a little bit more advanced in the knowledge of the truth were blind. And God wants to remove the scales. God wants to remove the veils. God wants to heal our eyes so that we can see what God intends to do within the next three, five, eight, ten years so that we can work together with Him in accomplishing the task that needs to be carried out in order to prepare the groundwork for the kingdom of God here on earth. Amen? Why don't we just stop and pray right now and ask the Lord to heal our eyes, to deliver us from this spirit of slumber, from this spirit of deep sleep, from this spirit of blindness, to remove the scales, to remove the blinders, that we might see and see clearly, not dimly, but clearly, that we can see what's happening around us in our family, in our community. That we can see the opportunities, the multiple opportunities that God has given us to win souls, to bring souls into the kingdom. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. We know that your word has been given to draw our attention to the fact that many of us, because of our own sinful ways, had been blinded by the enemy. And we haven't been able to see, Lord, what you want us to see. We cannot see our, our own <coughs> wretched condition. We cannot see, Lord, the devastation that the enemy has caused in our lives, in our homes. We cannot see the spiritual dearth in our churches. We cannot see, Lord, the onslaught of demonic spirits over our community and over our country. We cannot see, Lord, uh, how Satan is wrecking havoc in high government circles, causing the, the President and the Congress and the Supreme Court to pass legislation that is endorsing many practices that are banned, outlawed by your word. Yes, I ask you, Lord, that you will quicken the eyes of our understanding. Tonight, Lord, I come against that spirit of blindness in the name of Jesus, 
And I command spiritual blindness to come out of the minds and the hearts of God's people that are gathered here tonight. I come against that spirit of slumber. I come against that spirit of deep sleep. I come against the spirit of doubt and unbelief that causes spiritual blindness. I come against that spirit of fear. I come against that spirit of greed. I come against that spirit of rebellion that has blinded us to the truth. And I command you, Satan, to come out of our lives. And especially come out of our eyes. Release God's people tonight. Loose God's, loosen God's people tonight. Come out, Satan. I command you in the name of Jesus. I bind you, I rebuke you, and I strip you of your powers. And I strip you of your rights. And I strip you of your weapons. And I command you out of God's people. And now, Holy Spirit, come and anoint our eyes with the balm of Gilead, with the eye salve that you have created so that we can see and see clearly, that we can see the glory of God manifest in the world today. Just come and minister to the Holy Spirit tonight. Quicken our spiritual senses so that we not only be, will be able to see, but we'll be able to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. That we'll be able to sense your presence, discern the presence of the Holy Spirit as well as the presence of Satan and his demonic host so that we can stand against them and we can bind them and rebuke them and command them out of our lives and out of our churches and, and out of our communities and our nations. Now, Lord, be glorified in our midst. Be glorified in our midst. That we will leave this camp better people, better fitted to serve you. Raise up, Lord Jesus, men and women that will go forth from this camp to proclaim the kingdom, to advance the kingdom, that we will be your instruments, your chosen instruments in these end times to bring freedom to the nations. Lord, work mightily in our lives so that we can be used of the Holy Spirit to bring life and strength and peace and joy to many people that lie in darkness in the shadow of death. We thank you. We bless you for what you have done in this camp meeting, and we're expecting even greater things. Now, may the Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit continue to manifest in and through us so that we will be God's vessels of honor, chosen and anointed for God's service in these end times. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. May God help you. May God bless you. And remember to pray for the parishes, Remember, pray for the outreach in Central South America. Pray as I travel tomorrow by car to Houston and then by plane to Guatemala. I don't know when I'll be back. I try to come here as often as I can, but it usually is about every two years. But I hope to see many of you here or elsewhere. And if not, you know we're going to gather. Huh? Yeah. We're going to be gathered together to give God the praise and the worship that only He deserves throughout eternity. How many can say praise the Lord? God bless you. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.